Hi and welcome to Off the Hill, your weekly roundup of the 2016 federal election. I'm Jill Shepherd, and each week I'll be joined by my colleagues from the Australian National University, Andrew Hughes and Ryan Goss, to discuss the week that was in Australian politics. And what a week it's been so far. On Tuesday, Treasurer Scott Morrison handed down his first budget, and by this weekend the Prime Minister will have likely called a July 2 election. There's certainly lots to talk about, so let's get started. First of all, we're going to talk about the narratives that have come out of the budget. Then we're going to talk about uh, a bit of the uncertainty that I think is surrounding this budget so far. Then we're going to finish up talking about the logistics of the forthcoming election. We'll make it sound a bit more fun than, uh, than that might seem. <laughs> so let's get started. Andrew, what did you think about the narratives coming out of the budget? Safe, steady, bland, unexciting, which is what they wanted, really, if you think about it. They didn't want us to fear or scare anyone and also make it hard for Labor to build that message against them during the election campaign itself. So they met all their targets, I think. I think they really had a, you know, they had the first exciting announcements in the first couple of minutes. Once that had died down, the rest of us sat there wondering what on earth this budget was doing to try and make us be engaged with it. But that was the whole point. It didn't want us to engage with it. It wanted us to realise it's status quo, steady as is. There's opportunities there for growth in the future. And very much to an inclusive budget. A lot of talk about we and how we build this. And this is your chance to do something. So it's not the kind of strategy that we see often, right? <clears throat> Yeah, I think that's right. And it's an unusual, I suppose, in the sense that the budget is falling just so close to an election mm. campaign. There hasn't yeah. been one like this in recent memory. And I think, Andrew, would it be right to say that in addition to building that steady narrative, that steady image about the government, there was also an attempt to contrast that with what was portrayed as a Labor black hole, even in the couple of days before the budget. So we saw this extraordinary thing where, in addition to the budget leaks about what would be in the budget, Scott yeah. Morrison uh, seems to have leaked information about what he argued was a Labor black hole in a hypothetical policy that had been reduced some months before. That, and that's right. I'm looking at Chris Bowen's face when he realised there was a huge black hole of that significance and how do you then correct it in like a short space of time they have to them um, and in an election campaign too. And remember, Malcolm Turnbull's made this really clear. He wants to run the election on economic leadership. How do you do that when you've got a budget black hole of $20 billion? No, but we have seen this before from the UK, right? Yeah, I think that's right. And I think um, the slogans and the language that we've seen around, well, the Prime Minister doesn't like three word slogans, but the, the language <laughs> we've seen around the government's budget is very similar to that with, that was used by the UK Tories to win the 2015 general election. And so the slogan in the UK was our long term economic plan. And Malcolm Turnbull mm -hmm. used those exact words talking with Fran Kelly the day after the budget. So there's similarities there and there's, although the two countries are obviously very different, there are similarities in the way that the Conservative parties are trying to sell their economic management. Yep. And so it's really put Labor in this bind where they can only be accused now of class warfare. And exactly Scott Morrison's right. already said that. Yeah, and, and by also the coalition tactic of copying some of Labor's big policy announcements and putting them into their budget, where do Labor go now? What announcements can they make which seem as though, okay, this is about them also being economic leaders? Mm. Puts it really you know, hard on them on the back foot in particular to try and come up with ideas for reform, ideas so they can grow in their traditional strong areas of you know, education, welfare, the environment, things like that. One place that at the ALP really may be able to attract the government at this point is the uncertainty that we've seen surrounding this budget. I mean, there wasn't mm. much in it on Tuesday night, and since we've seen a lot of those announcements really get unpicked. Um, talk us through it. Yeah, well, I think what's interesting there, Jill, is the, the extent to which the budget served as a proxy for a policy platform launch. Mm. It was so mm. close to the election, and yet it had the disadvantage that unlike during an election campaign, these policies couldn't be rolled out one after another, one per day, in yeah. neat announceables. And so we saw a <coughs> lack of clarity, a surprising lack of clarity from government ministers in the mm. days after the budget about, for example, whether or not the PATH internship program was voluntary or compulsory, exactly what the cost would be over 10 years of the yeah. business tax cuts. And those are things from the Prime Minister and the Treasurer and other ministers that we might have expected a little bit more clarity around. That clarity may come, but it reflects, I think, the difficulties posed by the proximity to the election. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And that's not something that we see much of, as you say. This, this kind of back-to-back -back budget election is fairly new ground for a lot of us. I think what, and, and reflecting that, is this really strange announcement that they've got in the budget that's costed, but it's just sitting there as a bit of a blank yeah. space. They're yeah. going to sort yeah. of fill the details in later. We haven't seen that before. And I think that's fascinating from a political scientist perspective, from a, you know, what are we voting for perspective, or at least when we're starting to think now, voters are starting to think at this point, okay, I may, mightn't have made up my mind entirely, but now it's crunch time. Now we have to start thinking about it. But there are these uncertainties that are really lingering. 
Yeah, exactly right. And if you're trying to build a campaign and build a narrative for a campaign, and you, you've gone down the safe, steady, bland approach with your budget, mm -hmm. but then you have this big question mark remaining, who are the winners and losers out of this $1.6 billion? It raises you know, the very thing they're afraid of in the first place, uncertainty, back into their campaign, back into their narrative. They need to remove that really quickly now. The campaign could be launched. They might do these announcements, as Ryan said, one a day sort of thing out of the UK playbook, mm. out of the Linton Crosby um, sort of you know, strategy guide. But at the same time, there's a risk there because now people are thinking, well, every day do I have to look forward to being either you know, a winner or a loser? And that's, and that's <laughs> the very narrative you don't want to have happen to you come at the start of an election campaign when you want to have all the narrative back on you mm. and the opposition trying to chase what you're saying. You know, if anything, now the opposition's got a good chance to actually build and construct their own certainty around this I, I hate the idea of winners <clears throat> and losers. So we're going to move on to something that yep. I'm a bit more comfortable with, and that's elect <laughs> electoral logistics. This is, um, this is my particular interest. So... Ryan, you're the lawyer. Talk us what through. Talk, talk us through what a double dissolution means for us. Yeah, well, this is the first double dissolution in three decades, mm. and uh, it does have all sorts of constitutional requirements around them, and uh, all sorts of constitutional technicalities. And we may see some of that, but at its heart, this is just a particular sort, a special sort of federal election. Mm. And the big difference here is that a regular federal election, the Senate is only half up for election, and the full House of Representatives up for election. At a double dissolution election all of the Senate and all of the House are up for re-election. So that is the difference in constitutional terms. It's a different way of electing the Senate. It means that the quota, the number of votes you need to get into the Senate, is less in a double dissolution. So it's about 7.7% .7 of the vote to get into the Senate. And I think that raises the prospect that we may clear out some of the current micro parties mm. and current mm. independents, but we might replace them with some other minor parties or other independents. I think we. I think the Turnbull might find that he had to be careful what he wished for. I think you're right there about that, Jill. I mean, in particular, too. Look, playing the short game, long game strategy mm. here. Um, short game is okay. Early on, you can win the election. You can also, with a double dissolution, you come in clean. You can say, "I have a mandate. Mm. I have a clean mandate. All both houses of parliament." So you can run your policy early on. You can put in your, all the stuff you talked about, all the things you had the trigger for. You implement those ideas. At the same time, you still have to worry about the Senate. You don't know how the numbers are going to fall <laughs> in the Senate. Long game strategy here is you've done a deal with Nick Xenophon and that plays out. So the next three years, you've done a nice deal with him. He becomes, in a way, like the Democrats who were once upon a time for John Howard. Nick Xenophon will clean up two or three Senate seats, won't you, Joe? You're both very optimistic. You're both very optimistic. I'm very <laughs> dubious about, about Senate polling. I'm dubious about Nick Xenophon's chances of, of really turning a lot of the goodwill that he that he yeah. uh, attracts into votes. Yeah. Uh, I think that people still, you know, there's a homing principle in, in political science, that people come back to their their major party, that the, right. the major party that they identify with. And so I think yeah. these things come in cycles. But I tend to agree that uh, Turnbull may have got more than he bargained for, yeah. that I think maybe the short game strategy is replacing the long game strategy. Yeah. And that down the track, because as you say, Ryan, the lower quotas, who knows who could be elected? Exactly right. You're looking at Lazarus getting re-elected. You're looking at possibly Lambie getting re-elected. Yep. Who yep. thought we'd be sitting here six months ago talking about this? Exactly right. Right? Yeah. Maybe we should all predict a bit less. But I think this is really interesting, and this, this really gets to uh, what I guess is my analysis, that um, I, I think Turnbull made a, a real error of judgment here. I don't think that he should have gone to a double dissolution, and I think that when he launched this sort of rhetorical campaign, he wasn't expecting to. So interesting. let's yeah. see how this plays out. It's going to be really fun. Yeah. Now, final thoughts for the week. On that note, Ryan... My final thought for the week is that it looks like we will have a LNP opposition leadership spill in Queensland at the same time as the first few days of the election campaign. <laughs> Not ideal. The Federal Coalition needs to defend a lot of seats in Queensland, so they'll be hoping that the state-level bloodletting is quick and uh, pay <laughs> relatively painless. <laughs> Absolutely. Andrew? I'm going for a Sunday afternoon election announcement. I think we'll see the Prime Minister using all the, um, you know, all the resources of the Prime Minister the nice scene of, you know, in the car, the white car going to Government House to make the election announcement, taking up the airtime just in time for the 6pm Sunday night news, which of course hits the coverage on Monday morning straight away, back on the government narrative, back again on their messaging, really hard for the opposition to counter. We'll see you down in Yarralumla, waving to C1. With the kids. My, <laughs> that's, that's horribly sad. <laughs> that's great parenting. My final thought is that um, Manus Island, it's sort of being touted at the moment as 
possibly a negative distraction for the government. I think they're actually relishing this. That's incredibly cynical of me. But I think as long as people are talking about immigration, they poll well. Yeah. And I think that's a, a very cynical electoral benefit for the government. You've been so working in politics for t- too long. I have been in <laughs> politics for too long. Thanks, Andrew. Until next week, enjoy your politics. <laughs>